John, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've got a great uh, book out. Full disclosure, I wrote the foreword to it called uh, Popular Economics. Why the, what the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, and LeBron James can teach you about economics. And there's not an equation in the book. Yes, it's a good sign that you wrote the foreword. It must be a very good book. So. <laughs> and yes, there are no equations in the book. The conceit that you need to do math to understand economics is one of, one of, the, one of the tragedies of modern times, as, as I think we both know. So uh, let's start since uh, we have a lot of investors. Why should an investor read a book like this with hardly any numbers in them other than page numbers and chapter heads? Well, they should because there's a basic to good economic growth that leads to good stock market returns. If you get the four basics right, taxes, regulation, trade, and monetary policy, you are going to get amazing investment returns. And so you can look at these four in the book explained in easy to understand terms, again, no charts or graphs or equations, and then you can see how the world is going, which countries are moving in this direction. If the U.S. is moving broadly in this direction, you can make broad investment decisions based on reading a book like this because you'll know what drives growth. The market's done very well since, on, ostensibly, since March of 2009. Isn't that a real... Uh, shows that Janet Yellen and Barack Obama and Ben Bernanke know what they're doing? <laughs> it shows the exact, exact opposite of that. It, it, it's, I think we know, if you look at the markets right now, to some degree, it's, it's an endorsement of what's in, uh, what's in here. This book argues that it's government activity that invariably slows down economic growth. And so realistically, since 2012, President Obama's presidency ended. There will be no further substantial legislation from him. And so because that, that's a huge positive, we have gridlock in Washington. Markets love when neither Republicans nor Democrats can do anything. Added to that, President Obama gave him credit. Who knows why he did it? But he did not reappoint Ben Bernanke. And that is a huge positive to the markets because Janet Yellen, even though she believes all the poison that he did, is not going to have the power to do what he did at the Fed, to do the damage he did to the economy, to impose the horrid thing that we call QE on the economy, and markets have loved that. There may be gridlock in Congress, but regulatory agencies seem to be making lots of laws on their own that are complicating people's lives. Uh, they are, and, and let's face it, they're holding back the economy, but we've always had a problem of regulation. I think the, what, what's, what's, what's overall good right now is that even though Congress would like to be activist, we have Republicans and Democrats divided. Of course, the pundits say that's a bad thing. Logic says that's a very good thing. It's when Congress is acting that they are moving around resources that we've created in ways that the markets would not dictate. So almost by definition, Congress acting is going to slow down the economy. So with this, with President Obama unable to do anything, with Congress unable to do anything, this is a good time to be invested in the stock market. Goes against the grain? Goes against the grain, but let's, as we know from, from, from following Jude Winiski, it is surprise that drives markets downward. Crashes never occur because of something the markets already know. The crashes occur when surprises enter the marketplace. So with there being gridlock in the marketplace, the possibility of Washington foisting a major surprise on us is greatly reduced. Now in economics, you focus on people rather than uh, economists' conceit, or I should say belief, <laughs> that uh, this is a hard science or semi-hard science like physics or chemistry. Uh, how would you define economics? I would just define it as von Mises did. It's human action. It's human nature. It is the easiest thing in the world to understand. There is no subject easier than economics because it's just a study of why people do things. And in our case, we're trying to figure out wh how we can make it possible for people to be more productive because we know they've got infinite demands. How can we make it possible for them to maximize their pursuit of those demands through production? And so if you get, the, again, the four basics right, taxes, regulation, trade, and monetary policy, you have infinite production and, as a result, demand. Economists always talk about the need to stimulate demand, ignoring the fact that at the end of each month when people pay their bills and credit card bills, people's demands are 
very high. It's just the creation of resources to meet those demands. I like your skepticism because I share it. The last thing governments would ever want or need to do is stimulate demand. That is why we get up in the morning. That's why we go to school. That's why we get jobs. We have infinite wants and our production is, is our demand. So the only way to stimulate demand is to stimulate the supply side of the economy to remove government activity in the economy that impedes our ability to produce. And that's taxation, that's regulation, that's trade tariffs that tax the reason we work, and that's unstable money. You mentioned uh, the four things that uh, are your path to infinite prosperity. Uh, let's start with uh, trade. Um, why is that important? I I think I know why, but it's, it, it, explain it. <laughs> I know and you then, know why. And, and then, and then uh, <laughs> t t tell us why this focus on trade deficits and all the things that people get hung up on is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Well, good. This will be fun. Trade is important because that's why we work. We have demands and, and we work so that we can get what we don't have. Free trade means is the most, one of the most beautiful things you could ever conceive. It means the most talented people on earth are vying to serve you, vying to get your business. I can't think of anything more exciting, but with trade there's something even more exciting than that. Free trade maximizes the possibility that we as individuals will get to do the work that most animates our individual talents. What an amazing thing. With free trade, you focus on what you do best and you trade the fruits of that labor for all the things that you don't have, oh, by the way, with other people doing what they do best. It's a wonderful thing, and that's why rich countries invariably are free traders, because free trading countries allow, almost by definition, are telling their citizens, go out and do what you do best. So uh, what about uh, trade that leads to outsourcing and uh, China accumulating all this money and all the things that uh, worry people? Well, uh, when, let's face it, what is an economy? An economy is just a collection of individuals. It's not a blob. It's just you, me. It's people all around us doing what makes us best off. So as individuals, we are expert outsourcers. Thank goodness you and I don't cut our hair. Thank goodness you and I don't grow our food or raise it. Thank goodness you and I don't, didn't build the, the homes that we live in. Um, it's because of outsourcing that we get to live lives of abundance because again, we focus on what we're good at and then let others do what they're good at, which is making apartments and houses for us, growing our food, in our case, raising it because we like red meat, all those things. Imagine what difficult, cruel lives we'd, have, we'd lead if we didn't outsource. Well, businesses are doing the same thing. They're merely doing it on a larger scale. They're figuring out a way to, to, to produce, to do what they do best. And in doing that, creating a product, they're leaving it up to others to do what they're doing best on the way to the most profits and growth. Doesn't that, uh, you know, it's one thing to outsource to a uh, farmer in Iowa, but outsourcing overseas, doesn't that hurt American jobs and uh, make our economy poorer that uh, we're losing <laughs> all this? Um, it, it's said, but, but let's face it, it's not. What is the biggest outsourcer in history? The computer. Did that put Americans in bread lines? If you look throughout history, all economic advances that we know about, the productivity, were big job destroyers. The tractor destroyed infinite amounts of jobs, well into the millions, but Americans didn't starve. We used to all work on the farms. The car destroyed lots of jobs but it also allowed us to do all sorts of other work. The computer, the same thing, the ATM machine. And so outsourcing to another country is just, is just is the, basically the same as what we do when we outsource to machines here. It doesn't weaken us, it makes us better off. Imagine how brutal life would be if we didn't have cars and tractors and computers and internet. I know I'd be miserable, I think you would too. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, money, one of the most misunderstood subjects in the world. Give first a quick definition of money and why trying to manipulate its value uh, just as a source of grief and mischief. I'm going to surprise you with something here. No, I'm not going to surprise you. This isn't wealth. Try to take this to a desert island. It will get you nothing. Money is just a measure of wealth. Um, it was created because, let's face it, I want red meat. But, the, but, but, that, but that vintner doesn't want my red, red meat. He, is, he, is a, he, wants, he wants vegetables from someone else. 
Money is how we measure wealth. It's what we use to exchange it. I've got bread, I want your wine, I measure the value of the bread with the money. Now if money's floating around in value, imagine the chaos that results there, you know this well. It's the equivalent of a chef or, or a construction worker dealing with a, with a minute that's changing the length or a foot changing the length. If so, lots of inedible food and leaning towers of Pisa around the world. Money's the same way when it's not certain its purpose, which is as a facilitator of exchange and ideas and investment, is it's robbed of it, and so you get less wealth creation, less production, all that. Isn't devaluing the dollar good because it uh, makes our exports cheaper and imports dearer, and therefore uh, we come out ahead in some way? Isn't it amazing <laughs> what people believe? And we've got to teach them all what's not true, but think about this. There are no companies and no jobs without investment first. Now, what are investors doing when they commit capital to, to, jo to jobs and companies? They're saying, here's a million dollars. We hope to get $10 million back five, 10 years down the line. So when you devalue money, you're telling the very investors who would commit capital to the commercial leaps that power economies forward, that if you do such a thing and you're lucky enough to get a return, it's going to come back and devalue dollars. Is it any wonder then that throughout history when currencies are debauched that A, the economy weakens and B, society is torn asunder because um, people want growth. They are wired to, to demand things. They are wired to love economic growth. Devaluation of money is the exact opposite of growth because it puts investment into hiding rather than the ideas of the future. Now. Uh Taxation. Oh, by the way, can't leave this on the table. Uh, how do we get a stable value for the dollar or any currency? Any currency. We look for the commodity most stable of all and define the currency in that because we want the currency's value to be unchanging over time so that people can be confident about investing in companies where returns may be 10, 20 years out. What we've found throughout history is that cigarettes, seashells, they're better than what we have now, but they're not as good as gold. The reason gold has been used as the definer of money for hundreds, maybe some would say thousands of years, is because it's the most stable commodity the marketplace has come up with. And so we need to redefine the dollar in terms of gold. Now, gold was $1,900 an ounce in 2011. Today it's about 1200 Is that stability in value? No, it's not. It's just better than what we had. <laughs> the way, way we need to look at it is when George W. Bush got into office, we're, we're not partisans here, are we? <laughs> a dollar bought one two hundred fiftieth of an ounce of gold. As of 2011, under President Obama, a dollar bought one nineteen hundredth of an ounce of gold. Is it any wonder that the electorate was so unhappy that economic growth was so sluggish during that time? Because again, investors have choices. They are delaying consumption of dollars with an idea of getting them back in the future. They're not going to invest in the Microsofts and Intels and FedExes and Googles that make our lives so much better if they're worried that any returns they get will come back into devalued dollars. The fact that the dollar is in better shape today, I think very neatly explains an economy that's starting to turn around. Um, <clears throat> regulation, which some say is a form of taxation, don't regulations help keep us have safe food and safe drugs and prevent all those nefarious people in the marketplace from euchring us? Well, as we know, as fast food fans, what makes food safe is that we come away from it having had a good meal. If food is bad, if it doesn't, if, if, it's, if it's unhealthy, if it's hurting us, you and I communicate that. That's the beauty of a marketplace is we're constantly communicating. Uh, the truth about food, about drugs, all sorts of things. And so markets are great regulators. Let's face it, Coca-Cola is arguably one of the most powerful brands on earth. But when they tried to foist new Coke on the marketplace, people revolted big time. And the consumers, who are the best regulators of all, said, you better switch back or we are going to leave you for Pepsi. And so you think about regulation in a more broad sense. What are you asking for? You're asking people who couldn't get jobs in, in the regulated industries to oversee those who could. Probably one of the most realistic things in the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, which wasn't a very remarkable film, 
was that the regulator trying to get Leonardo DiCaprio, the story there was that he couldn't pass the Series 7, which was why he was a regulator. Let me tell you, I'm not wildly smart. I've taken the Series 7, it was a driver's test. It couldn't have been easier. And so when you're looking at regulation, you're asking those who aren't capable of doing the work to oversee those who could. Is it any wonder that it never, ever works, that, it, that it invariably it fails? It's the equivalent of asking Rutgers to beat the New York Giants every year in football. Not going to happen. The talent mismatch is too big. Let's deal with some of the myths in the world. Uh, problem of inequality. You say inequality is great. Oh, it's beautiful. Inequality means that I've got a phone sitting in my pocket that I can do email on and surf the web and make calls around the world. Back in the 1980s, if I wanted these, one of these phones, it didn't exist, but there was a brick style phone that cost $3,995 that had a half hour of battery life. That's what inequality just signals that the lifestyle gap between the rich and poor is shrinking. Nowadays, we all have phones like this. You think about the computer. IBM made the first mainframe in the 1960s. Cost you over a million dollars. It would have filled more than this room and you couldn't do anything with it. Michael Dell's worth billions today precisely because he made the computer broadly accessible to people of all income classes. But I would argue that the biggest wonder and great thing about inequality that we don't talk about enough is once again that an economy is just a collection of individuals. What is bad for an individual about pursuing in life what most animate, animates that individual's uh, best features. Was society made worse off because Harry Connick's better at playing the piano and singing than you and I are? Do we curl up in the fetal position because Eli Manning's a better pastor than we are? No, we, we love the stars in society. They, they, they're what make it wonderful and joyous. Imagine a world without Jeff Bezos. I don't want to. Government, uh, you say, don't create wealth? Didn't, didn't free markets cause the depression? <laughs> <laughs> Governments don't create wealth because they have no wealth. They have no resources. That's not a libertarian slogan for me. That's just fact. They can only tax or spend what they've extricated from us first, what they've taken from the private sector. And so they like to say, or people on the left love to say, well, the government created the Internet. No, it didn't. It took resources from the private sector to create a very crude version of the internet that would never have passed muster in the marketplace. It was the free markets that created the internet and it was also the free markets that gave government resources to create a version that did not work. Budget deficits. Now, this Republicans sometimes don't like to hear you say budget deficits aren't the real problem. What is the real problem? The real problem is spending. Let's face it, again, governments have no resources. When they spend, you could argue they're in deficits at all times because they are spending what's not theirs, what they've extracted from the productive private sector first. And so what would we prefer? Would we prefer an annual balance budget of $3.5 trillion or an annual deficit of $1.1 trillion with $1.1 trillion in spending? I think we know the answer to this. We'd prefer the deficits because that signals Nancy Pelosi, John Boehner, Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell are allocating much less in the way of the economy's resources than they would if we had a balanced budget. It's the size of government that matters. It's the size of government that signals all the cancer cures we don't enjoy, all the internet innovations, all the private planes we're not flying around. That's what should bother us, not that we can finance spend our deficit spending around the world. So consumers, Keynesians, will tell us uh, many times don't spend enough. Uh, that savings are a uh, paradox of savings, that it uh, hurts the economy when we save a lot of money. Oh, wow, gosh. They make life so easy for us. The problem is they're not challenging us enough. We could be better at this if they could challenge us, but that's a good example. So let's think, I use them in the book Paris Hilton, because people say, well, she should be relieved of her wealth because she doesn't know how to use it. Well, Paris Hilton can't spend all of her millions, so what happens when she saves it? Okay, if it goes into the bank, it's immediately lent to people not as rich as she is uh, for, who need cars, who need houses, who need a new computer, or who, need, uh, who want a small business loan. So the act of savings, by definition, doesn't subtract from demand simply because banks don't borrow money from people only to, to just stare lovingly at it. But she could also get aggressive with her savings, put it in the stock market. Is that bad if public companies have access to more capital to grow? 
or maybe she'll put it in a private equity fund. Okay, that means that her wealth is being redistributed to, to businesses on their deathbeds that need ca capital to resuscitate themselves. Or a venture capital fund, beautiful. She's redistributing her wealth to the smartest people on earth in Silicon Valley who will create the next Google and Microsoft. I can't think of a bad thing about savings, and I especially don't think it's bad when the rich who have access to so much capital get to hold on to their wealth and through their savings redistribute it. Let's get to the death tax they call the estate tax. Uh, somebody like uh, Paris Hilton didn't make her money, she inherited it. And uh, therefore, she's living a frivolous life. Sh should she be allowed to do that? She should be allowed to do it, but imagine if she, if, if she could take it all with her, maybe she would have less of an incentive to spend all that wealth in the first place. But I think the way we should look at the death tax is call it what it is. It's the anti-entrepreneurial dream tax. That's what it is. There are no entrepreneurs without capital. And one of the people I talk about in my book is someone we both thought a lot of, uh, uh, Al Newhart, the founder of USA Today. He had dreams. He grew up with nothing. He was able to create USA Today thanks to capital, thanks to people, thanks to wealth remaining in the private sector where it can fund entrepreneurial ideas. The other one that I talk about, because I know we're both sports fans, is ESPN. It was a joke in the 1970s. It nearly went under. If not for an investment from the Getty Oil Trust, this was John Paul Getty, once the richest American, leaving billions behind to his grandkids and kids. If not for him being able to do that, ESPN wouldn't exist today. So when we think about the death tax and think about, oh, we need to relieve people who didn't earn their wealth of it, what we're really doing is robbing those who are not rich of the ability to pursue their dreams, their entrepreneurial dreams, because that's what happens when we leave wealth in the private sector. Wall Street versus Main Street. You say Wall Street bonuses should be bigger. Absolutely. <laughs> Wall Street gets rich by virtue of getting capital to these businesses we love. Apple, Intel, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. Uh, internet companies, you and I, everyone we know could not live without them today. And Wall Street got the funding for them. To Schumpeter called it right, he called it investment bankers and uh, capitalists par excellence. The problem right now is people equate Wall Street with bailouts. Well, precisely because we love Wall Street, we should not want bailouts because in any capitalist society, failure is healthy. It's a sign of evolution. Silicon Valley is the richest part of the United States precisely because the vast majority of its businesses fail. Wall Street should be allowed to do the same, and if so, the bargain should be this. Make as many millions as you want, providing capital to the companies of the future and merging them and doing all the wonderful things you do. But if you fail, on occasion you will, we will not back it up. Everyone wins in that scenario. I want the, the best out capital allocators in the world to get paid as much as possible because that means my life is better off. Energy independence, what do you have against that? <laughs> well, we're not television independent. We're not, uh, thank goodness we couldn't watch Downton Abbey. We're not shoe independent. That's good because Italians are better at making shoes than we are. We're not uh, banana independent. That's okay, Guatemala does a pretty good job. I don't see the difference with oil. Um, oil is, is plentiful in the world around us. Every oil producing nation on earth could embargo us tomorrow. They could be war, at war with us also. We would still buy their oil. We just buy, buy it from those who s sell that to them. What energy independence hides is that you can't do everything. It hides the basis of comparative advantage. LeBron James could play in the NFL in addition to the NBA, but it would be at the expense of being the best, highest paid basketball player on earth. That's how we should look at energy. Sure, we're great at extracting energy from the ground, but the profit margins in energy are pretty low, about seven cents on the dollar. Um, it's 112th in, in the US uh, in terms of most profitable industries. So when we devote limited resources to extracting what is readily available around the world, we then devote less in the way of resources to technology and some of these really advanced te techniques that are far more profitable. It's the equivalent of Michael Jordan playing baseball rather than basketball. He can do it. We can extract oil, but at the expense of future Microsofts and Intels and Googles that are much bigger wealth and life enhance enhancers. I will just add, 
when you pursue energy independence, you pursue that which Equatorial Guinea can do, what Iran can do, what Russia can do, backwards countries. When we pursue what we're best at, we do that which no one else can do. That's the source of wealth. John, thank you. The book is called Popular Economics. No charts, no numbers, just people and common sense. Thank you. Thank you very much.